Hi guys, it's Lucy. So today I wanted to talk about two books that I read recently. Um, the first one is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante, and then the other is another Murakami book um, from a long time ago, Kafka on the Shore. So starting with My Brilliant Friend, this is the first book of a four novel series by um, an Italian author. So I'm reading it in the English translation. And I've heard that, um, well, for first of all, it's extremely popular. And I've heard that it's recently released into a Netflix series. But I have to say that this is one of those books that I'm not sure if a series can actually, a TV show can actually capture all the nuances that you experience um, like from a, as a reader. So this reminded me a lot of the uh, six novel series called My Struggle, my struggles um, by Carl Alve Nosgaard and of that series I've read two so I think it was translated from the Norwegian and it's similar in the sense that um, you have this it's almost it sounds like it's autobiographical although in this particular one I think in the interviews the author has said that it's not it's not strictly like it's not based on her own life but it is biographical in a sense um, describing, I guess, like an, an experience of a generation, like from a woman's perspective. Whereas for for um, Carl Alvin Osgaard, that was, I think, almost completely autobiographical to the point where he, I think, regrets oversharing. I remember um, reading in another interview. Um, it is similar, but I think this is better. I don't know if um, for anyone who's read both, I would love to know how, if I'm you know, like uh, making a reasonable comparison, like linking the two. But just from the first novel alone, it's more complex. Whereas the other one, I think it is almost um, like a magnifying glass or like a microscope. And it's from a man's perspective. And this is where like, I don't want to be um, gender, like, you know, gender biased in any way. But I just think that it feels a little bit more singular whereas um, and I think it, there's there's a interesting um, difference of the age and country as well of course um, Norway developed differently than um, Napoli but and also from a man's perspective versus a woman but I really feel that this series or this book was more like more complex you get more from a woman's perspective there's always more observed perspectives that rings very true like she's not i don't feel like she's making it up or and um we can you know, label it as overthinking but it really comes through in the brilliance of the writing because she's writing less words these books i think have a much less word count than for each book alone and also there's only four of these books versus six books six bigger books for um, the other series she's able to accomplish more with less words that in and itself um, translation versus translation she's able to capture more perspectives not just her own and some of it is actually quite like twisty like it's unexpected sometimes but totally makes sense so it's almost uh, revelations like a while to reading um, between these characters and also her own and there's also this coming of age perspective as a, as a girl woman at that time in Italy and also as like a Chinese Canadian to me the the most the when I think of Italy the most separate like way that I can really differentiate is maybe northern Italy I, as I understand it is a bit more affluent than southern Italy but to me southern Italy basically only means Sicily and here we're talking about um, Napoli and these four novels are being nicknamed the Neapolitan novels the only I think contact I have you know that touches that region is basically a Neapolitan pizza to be to be very like simplistic and very honest but um, the translator feels the need to actually um, 
explicitly say like this character said this in a formal Italian versus this character said in dialect. So apparently there is a Napoli Neapolitan dialect that is very that is very um, recognizable and also different from the formal Italian that maybe someone who's learning Italian would be you know dipping their toes into, and. And it's not just that there's a difference, but the fact that there is a perceived um, classism related based on which dialect that is being spoken and also the um, how, uh, how good someone is at speaking formal Italian was almost like a measure of how sophisticated they are. So, and there's that education aspect as well. And for her coming out of um, for the main character coming out of a family or neighborhood sort of environment that is very um, Neapolitan, her going to school and learning all this Latin Greek formal Italian is, is and also experiencing life and growing up, um, looking outside into wider Italy, like we're not even speaking like on a global scale. So these books feel very local and very personal because of that like you're experiencing this sort of exploration coming out of the neighborhood coming out of a certain social class or social background that is um, very eye-opening and also very it feels very sensitive so that sensitivity I got and I think I think that's what um, reminded me of the Carl Alvey Nosgaard like as a child growing up that sensitivity to all these people their relationships and um, how things are experienced between other people too so anyway I'm fascinated by this book it's so good and I actually have already sourced um, books two three and four on the used book market aka Facebook marketplace and I think I, I really look forward to reading the rest of the three um, I have a feeling that those three won't lose steam as it kind of felt with the Carl Alvey Nosgaard my struggle um, novels um, an interesting thing I observed is that there are so many more copies of used books on the series available in French like um, in Montreal, like Gatineau, like Quebec area. And I wonder if the French translation is better and more enjoyable or more nuanced than the English versions that we get because it's like a Latin language to a Latin language and how, but dialect can't really be translated that way either. So I think like, I, I could see why, like as an Italian author, she sort of broke um, a certain, like threshold for fame I think in even like regionally because it's so rare to see probably um, something in dialect being held to such fame I think uh, and especially at an international level too so I'm curious about the series and how how that's that won't that there's no way like if we're not Italian speakers we won't really recognize formal Italian being spoken versus dialect Italian like the actors would only have to portray that through sort of tones and maybe expressions which I don't know I really I really enjoyed the, um, the experience um, of reading this in words first because that was one of the comments of um, a lot of readers the fact that the uh, the series lost some of that nuance um, on the screen versus on paper so I really recommend that and then on another completely separate note, the second book that I had a great time reading was Kafka on the Shore by Murakami. And this book, I think it was, uh, it was written, he started writing it around 2001, so over 20 years ago, and this was sort of the beginning of a certain mold. I recognize a lot of the themes in the other books as well, especially uh, 1Q84 and also uh, one of the last latest ones, uh, Killing Commendadori. There are all these themes around living spirits and this human darkness that like um, 
really started off with this one because it wasn't quite there in Norwegian wood and I think before that he was mostly writing short stories so between Norwegian wood and Kafka on the shore like these two sort of I see as dichotomies of his style excluding like short stories I really enjoy Kafka on the shore so much more like I'm definitely on the Kafka on the shore camp I, I know that like um, readers generally have a preference and I I, ha I still have to do that spectrum um, sort of rating of where I think certain books fall as I read more of his and I think actually there's a new novel coming out and I really wonder like where that one sort of lies as well. I think he wrote it after pandemic or like during pandemic and it's been it's been a while since he's released a new novel so I'm very curious about that one coming out later this month. Um, but anyway, so in this book, because it is an earlier um, version of this style, I do think there are two characters that are so significant because they were, I feel like those two are deleted, like in the same sense in the later novels, which made them harder to follow for people. So the first character is Oshima, the librarian, um, who is sort of, who guided the main character under his wing when he ran away from home and just sort of gave him a job at the library to stay at. And the second character is Hoshino, who is that truck driver who really helped out Mr. Nakata, the, uh, the cat whisperer. And um, Hoshino and Oshima are both side characters who are super helpful and they make these comments that we lose in later novels. These comments are sort of describing that human darkness and explaining certain themes. Um, and these explanations are like that piece of link that I understand. Now I understand what those weird characters are and the twists and turns because when they don't, when there are no linkages like these characters, when they don't speak and when they're not there, you don't get that link. So it just feels very mysterious. It's still very um, appealing and compelling, but it's just you have you kind of have to guess why if if you haven't read. Kafka on the shore. So if I feel like for a hardcore like a Murakami like reader, this is a must and it's probably like a fundamental one to understand. There are certain things in Murakami books that are tidbits here and there that I really like to highlight and I think they kind of make the novels for me and if I just put it down for like a few years I might forget. So as an example this is something that I really resonate with, uh, or a few things that I really resonate with. He's talking about um, just reading novels like Arabian Nights, so this is I think main character, and he's saying they're full of obscene, violent, sexual, basically outrageous scenes, and they have this sort of vital living sense of play, of freedom, and that common sense that can't keep bottled up. I love it and can't let it go. And compared to those faceless hordes of people rushing through the train station, these crazy preposterous stories of a thousand years ago are, at least to me, much more real. How that's possible, I don't know. It's pretty weird. And speaking of the faceless hordes of people on the train station, um, there's this concept that's being introduced called hollow men. And I feel like he's written different versions of hollow men. like. Um, specific uh, type of personalities in later novels as well but he does mention them categorically here which I think um, is quite important um, and hollow men he says um, the kind T.S. Eliot calls hollow men people who fill up that lack of imagination uh, with heartless bits of straw not even aware of what they're, what they're doing but underlined um, hollow men as in narrow minds full of a uh, devoid of imagination intolerant um theories cut off from reality empty terminology usurped ideals inflexible systems those are the things that really frighten me what i absolutely fear and loathe and i underline that because all of this like intolerance theories cut off from like reality usurped ideals inflexible system it really reminded me of uh, current day I mean I know this is written on like more than 20 years ago but and it's a novel but like it kind of reminds me of the US 
media or like just just in general the elections and the politi- the way that pol- politics are being played out on screen like all of that is extremes and kind of cut off from reality or at least what's coming across is that and it's i can i can sift out more truth from a murakami novel than like what i can make sense of in real life and it's really weird but um it's really resonating um anyway so the conclusion is that hollow men being a lost cause and um something to be cautioned against avoided i don't know like it's up for um this is one of the themes that i think you could really draw it out but it's not like extremely fully explored here like in this novel particularly i think it's one of those things that he thinks on and maybe draw it out in future characters novels that kind of thing so and there's this huge part about um genji and the living spirits and that darkness and the boundary the inner darkness of the soul versus the physical darkness of outside so this is where that murakami theme of tunnels and wells and also um you know that area beneath like beneath um the mounds like where the priests go in and starve themselves i don't know i'm being like if you know what i'm talking about you know what i mean like that specific um type of metaphor that he draws on in later novels is kind of explained here as well um it's indescribable a lot of these metaphors and it i I, yeah it's if i were to actually dwell on it i think it can take me like a full-on essay to actually to, to actually um think it through um but yeah as a reading experience this is what i think for me makes a lot of the murakami novels uh very addictive um because they're all sort of similar and he doesn't quite fully explain um what he means in each one so it's just it's kind of felt and implied um anyway this last part i'm going to say i think it's more i identified it a lot with my what i see in my daily life um and the advice is you know just live each day as it comes um he's saying this this character is sort of regretting um that something so he's saying as long as i was alive i was something but somewhere along the line it all changed living turned me into nothing and the longer that I live, the more I've lost what's inside and ended up empty. And I bet the longer I live, the emptier, the more worthless I will become. And saying life isn't supposed to turn out like this. Isn't it possible to shift direction, to change where I'm headed? So this novel um, in a macro aspect is about that particular shift. So something has happened in the past and is heading towards a certain direction, but can the question is, can the characters do something to to call it basically and take control? Um, no, no, of course, it's not, it's not it's not a question in the novel, but I'm sort of, I don't I don't want to like give the whole plot um, away, but there's this sense when I read that of how for a lot of people I imagine today are living lives that they feel are on a certain track that somehow they put themselves on or they felt they were you know squeezed into and that's just the way it will be and that the choices that they make they don't really have a lot of choice in and sometimes i feel that way but i think this is when people sort of become hollow people or like at at a very big risk of becoming the so-called hollow people anyway things to think on getting too deep too fast but this is a great one i think um for a true murakami fan i i just i i just um ate this right up and i can't wait for um, the new one coming out let me know what you guys are reading or if you've read either of the two and what you think. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. Bye, guys.